the year was 1982. During that summer, an animated film created by former Disney animators was released to theaters called The Secret of Nim. Despite the lack of marketing from its distributor and facing serious competition from the more popular E.T. the Extraterrestrial, its debut performed decently well at the box office. However, its true success wouldn't appear until time gradually went by, as people progressively discovered the film through home media and cable viewings to the point that now, The Secret of Nim is recognized as an animated masterpiece and one of the greatest works of director Don Bluth. And yet, for several years, the feature was missing something. Something that no animated film at the time was complete in order to truly cement its legacy onto our culture. And what was that missing piece it needed? Oh yeah! An unnecessary direct-to-video sequel! Which leads us to today's subject, The Secret of Nim 2, Timmy to the Rescue. Welcome to my suffering. With a movie like this, I'm sure there are some people who are asking, why? Why make this follow-up 16 years later, have none of the original creators come back to make this, and have it be nothing like the original? I don't know, maybe MGM was jealous of all the money Universal was making with the Land Before Time sequels and they were like, We got Don Bluth stuff too! And then forted this thing out thinking that they'd be equally rewarded for it. And no, I suppose everything they did with All Dogs Go to Heaven wasn't enough. I remember years ago when I watched this movie for another video. Did, did the strawberries poop? Did it make it just a fart? No. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Is this really a musical? Why? I did not like it then, and I don't think that mindset will change here. And this is going to be extra painful for me too, because I love the first Secret of Nim. I even think it's one of the best animated films out there. So watching that beautiful piece turn into this is going to give me inner pain. But I don't think I can delay this any further. So now that we're going back to Thorn Valley, how bad did Timmy screw up trying to rescue this lost cause? Let's find out. The Story As you begin watching this feature, it opens with a quick summary about the Rats of Nim and how they became intelligent to the point of developing their own civilization, alongside a montage of the beautiful animation from the first movie as a reminder of the world that you're going back to. But then, after presenting the title and making you prepared for what lies ahead, The first frame gives you immediate regret. The best way to describe Timmy to the rescue is that this is what happens when someone who never watched The Secret of Nim was asked to make a sequel to The Secret of Nim, especially when the main plot point is entirely based on a lie that was established right at the beginning. The prophet Nicodemus predicted that Nim will again thrust its evil on the Raz, and a son of Jonathan Brisby will be chosen to save them. And in case you haven't seen the movie, Nicodemus never said this. In fact, nowhere in the first movie does it ever say that Timmy is destined for greatness. As a fresh reminder, because the sequel definitely won't tell you, the first secret of Nim is about the widowed mother Mrs. Brisby, and the dangerous lengths she went in order to protect her children, including the very sick Timothy, from getting destroyed by the farmer's equipment nearby. At the same time, she discovers who are the Rats of Nim, and the significant role that her late husband played in freeing them from human captivity, along with how they've evolved into intellectual beings with their own advanced society. I don't know if the sequel has a vendetta against the original, but any mention of that particular plot is non-existent. In fact, I could say the same about everything that made the first a legendary picture. The suspenseful tone, the intricate world building, the thought-provoking commentary of how people treat animals, the mature theming that can get a bit violent and political, all completely gone. Why need any of those? It's a cartoon! It's supposed to be for kids! We shouldn't make them feel shocked or make them think! Thinking is woke! 
And that's how we ended up with this broken down revisionist version of the tale, erasing all mentions of Mrs. Brisby's adventure and placing her son Timmy center stage so that he's the one who follows his father's footsteps to protect Thorn Valley. But the big difference is that this story is told like a dumb kids movie that's filled with obnoxious humor that's never funny and pointless musical numbers. When life is grim and things are drastic, just see me and all's fantastic! As for payment, he's elastic. He takes cash or gifts or plastic. Oh, trust me, we'll get into those abominations soon. And even if you haven't seen the first film, it's easy to tell that this is a terribly structured story. This is the kind of film where things feel like they suddenly happen and decided to just go with it to give the feature the illusion that the plot has some kind of plan. I wouldn't be surprised if they were producing the movie at the same time as the script was being written with no time for revisions. Martin's my brother. My mom's letter said he disappeared. She had no idea what happened to him. Well, he's at Nim. No, Martin's at Nim. They captured him. Is he all right? But what is possibly the worst thing regarding the story is how it feels like it drags on forever. Because the movie provides nothing for the audience to hold on to so that they can be encouraged to watch more, especially with its unappealingly bland child prodigy narrative, annoying scenes that are just time fillers, and a complete disregard to its predecessor, watching this movie feels like a long chore. The kind that will have you frequently check the timeline to know how many minutes are left until you are free from seeing Timmy's dreadful attempt of being a hero. And you know what the craziest part of this is? This movie is actually pretty short. Without the credits, Timmy to the Rescue is only 63 minutes long. Yes, just slightly above one hour. Yet with this atrocious storytelling, that hour can feel like four. Okie dokie, that's it. Last stop. Everybody, get off my back. As much as I may blast the film for having a hopeless script and having no respect for the original, I don't think it really matters because the movie delivers a sense that it just doesn't care. It's like it's aware that it has a dumpster fire of a story because nobody asked for this to exist in the first place, not even the film itself. If you're gonna do a follow-up to The Secret of Nim, but incapable of being anything like The Secret of Nim, then why even try? The animation. Amongst all of the picture's terrible traits, I'd argue that it's the animation that tells me the most that nobody who worked on this wanted to make this movie. The ultimate indicator that this is a purely soulless production. I am aware that it would be considered highly unfair to compare the visuals of Timmy to the Rescue to the master craftsmanship of The Secret of Nim. It would be like complaining that a week old McDonald's hamburger doesn't taste like a Wagyu steak. But still, it has to be mentioned that the quality of the animation didn't go downhill, it went on a massive freefall. And even if you want to try to judge it on its own merits, the comparison is unavoidable because the movie made the serious mistake of opening with clips from the first film. It's like it's saying to me, remember how great the animation of The Secret of Nim is? Well, that's not happening here. Here's a cheap cartoon we imported from Taiwan. <laughs> Come back to load a kitty litter. <laughs> ooh, ooh, hey, get back here! Oh, yes, it should be expected that a direct-to-video sequel has lower quality animation than its predecessor. But even seeing it as is, this looks awful. This could barely even pass what they put on television at the time. Even without knowing what happened behind the scenes, I can tell that this production was both highly rushed and little money was spent onto the budget. Admittedly though, I won't say that this is the worst animation in history. I might as well get the good merits out of the way and say that at least some of the work from the animators is okay. It has nicely painted backgrounds that capture the mood of the environment like the pleasant, colorful, and natural Thorn Valley, and the eerie and near-abandoned complex of Nim itself. And I suppose that it does manage to visually capture a world with intelligent rodents and play with the scale pretty well. 
not only presenting the adventure through their size, but also show how they create their own towns while still trying to live around the human world. Sadly, this is where the positivity ends, and those elements alone are not enough to consider this good animation. This is especially the case when you look at the characters. For one, their designs bite off more than they could chew. It may try to emulate the Don Bluth style of its predecessor, and on their own, they're passable, but like I said, with the time and money put onto this feature, it would be impossible for any animator to achieve that quality with the few resources given, as they end up looking like pale knockoffs. Not to mention that there is a harsh contrast between the characters and the backgrounds, where the backgrounds have their own layers of lighting and depth, while the characters pop out too much with its flat colors that almost never has any shadows to show its physical dimensions. One day you'll see, I will equal your fame, I will show the world. But then you have the character animation. Looking at a frame of this movie is one thing, but when seeing it come to life, woof, what an absolute mess. Yes, this is limited animation where a lot of shortcuts were taken for their movements, but I don't think anyone had the time to make any revisions to ensure that there is a natural flow to the scenes, especially when the action feels more clunky and awkward. It's even worse when you see them try to talk. Some may say that this is nitpicking territory, and I know that lip syncing can be a long and excruciating process in animation, but there is no hiding how this one missed its mark. You can actually make a drinking game out of the number of times when their mouths actually match their words. No, I don't mean the other way around because it's more common that the mouths go wherever they want regardless of what the characters say. The answer's no, isn't it? We're very sorry. The council decided that the risk to Thorn Valley was just too great. And don't forget that this movie is also a musical, so not only does the problem get amplified, but it also unintentionally becomes hilarious that the cast can't even lip sync for their lives. So much I'll never say. So much to throw away. All, All I had is gone. gone. Again, it's not the worst animation ever produced, and there are a few things that do look nice, but even by direct-to-video standards, this is subpar. A piece in which the minimum amount of effort was put together, not by choice, in order to produce something that could be considered animation. I wasn't expecting Don Bluth level of quality, but I wasn't expecting that the downgrade was this bad either. The Characters After the grand mission that both Jonathan Brisby and his wife went through to save the Rats of Nim on two separate occasions, it's time for the next generation to protect the rodents from harm's way. Or at least, one kid from the next generation. You're the hero type, not me. Oh, Nicodemus should have chosen you. For once you're right. I'm older and stronger than you. If Thorn Valley wanted Jonathan Brisby's son, why'd they pick the runt? Maybe he's right, but the more you think about it, the more you realize that it's actually everyone who is problematic, where it doesn't matter which Brisby kid they randomly pick. Oh no wait, no, I'm sorry, that Nicodemus foretold, they'll become a detestable prick regardless. That is exactly what happened to Timmy. He even said it himself that he doesn't know why he's the chosen one to be the next hero. In fact, nobody knows why it's him. To fulfill my destiny? Everyone keeps saying that, but I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Right now, nobody does, Timmy. You've got to adapt and improvise. And yet, everyone rolls with it anyways and spent years of enabling him as the next great hero of Thorn Valley. And the most messed up part about it is that after they successfully manipulated his mentality where he truly thinks of himself as a hero, what do they tell him? 
but I want to be in on the action. You're not ready to be a hero, Tim. Oh, really? You mean to tell me that an entire village spent several years gaslighting a kid into becoming this entitled brat who thinks he's destined for greatness because of what his father did, only to backtrack on everything and say that he's not ready? You know what? I hate to say it, but maybe Jenner was right. They should have abandoned the idea of going to Thorn Valley in the first place if it was going to make everyone toxic. Hear me. The Thorn Valley plan is the aspiration of idiots and dreamers. Which reminds me, as it is a sequel, some of the familiar characters do return for an encore. But of course, they are back as just a shell of their former selves. Mrs. Brisby's role was so reduced that you can almost say that she only has a cameo in here as Timmy's mom. Jeremy also returns to give this a bit of that Dom DeLuise comedy, but instead of spending time with his Mrs. Wright, he now works alongside a very out of place conning caterpillar named Cecil by pretending to be the Great Owl. And by the way, we have no idea where the fridge the Great Owl went. And as for Justin and Mr. Ages, they now play as Timmy's teachers and guardians. Uh, my boy, what have I been trying to teach you all these months? Um that it's okay for guys to wear the same underwear three days in a row? <laughs> well, that was just between us. There are also a couple of additional comic reliefs with these two cats that are the villain's henchmen. But they're annoying as F and they supply enough cringe for me to throw it right back at them to their face. But then you have this new character called Jenny. Admittedly, there is one thing about her that actually works in the context of a secretive Nim sequel. You see, not all the altered rodents escape Nim. There are six that remain stuck. And through the discovery of Jenny, the rats have to determine if they should rescue the remaining ones or protect themselves first. Since her parents are two of the six missing, she cannot wait to get an answer, and heads out with Timmy to go rescue them on their own. I'll give the movie that there is an idea there, something that could have helped expand the ideas of the original while sticking to the same mature tones and themes. Unfortunately, the movie isn't smart enough to do that, and that component is only a small side plot that gives them a coincidental purpose, while Jenny is left with a flat personality and a pointless love angle because Timmy needs to get the girl for some reason. I'm following my heart! I love you! Woo! I love you too! Ah, the sweet sound of true love. That only lasts for about three weeks. But then you have Timmy's brother, Martin. Oh boy, where do I begin with this guy? At the start, despite still having some love for him, he's jealous that Timmy gets to be proclaimed as the hero and not him. And through poorly established context, it results in him to turn evil and become the ruler of Nim, where he plots to take over Thorn Valley. Out of all the characters, Martin is easily the best one for one reason. Eric Idle. No cares were clearly given for the job. So Idol delivered what is possibly his most over-the-top performance, making his moments unintentionally enjoyable with how crazy he became. I'll also give credit to Dom DeLuise doing well with his acting too by keeping the spirit of his character alive in the film, but if there is one reason to watch this, it's to see Eric Idol voicing a rad who becomes mad with power. I know! A ringside seat so you can watch me unfold my master plan! Tonight, the moon is full, and I attack Thorn Valley! No! Your soon-to-be zapped friends will be my willing soldiers. Quite a shock. No pun intended. You're insane! Ah! Oh, thank you. While Timmy is supposed to rescue both Thorn Valley and the rest of the Rats of Nim, all the characters are such lost causes that it feels like there's no point in saving anything here. The Songs Uh-oh, we got an animated film from the 1990s! You know what that means, right? It's musical time! We all know how the experiments at Nim made the rats intelligent, but let's see how those experiments make them sing and dance! Considering how almost everything in this picture is a disaster, 
It's not hard to imagine that the songs are all salt to an open wound. Not only are these numbers nothing more but filler to extend the movie's running time and to have it follow the trend of that period, but the songs themselves just suck. Much like the writing, they feel like the kind of songs that a kid would make up on the spot because they're bored. You know when they sing randomly and keep having difficulties to continue the lyrics but keep rolling with whatever they say anyways? That's exactly the tone that these musical numbers have. To show you what I mean, the first song they got is Come Make the Most of Your Life, where everyone at Thorn Valley welcomes Timmy and never endlessly hype him up to say that he will become a hero just like his dad. After that, there's I Will Show the World, Timmy's inspirational song where he is determined to become like Jonathan Brisby. As much as he believes that he is destined to do great things, being a singer is not one of them. One day they'll know me, they'll hear what I've done. I will show the world I'm my father's son. After that, there's Magic Mystery Show, the fun filled conga number where Jeremy and Cecil scam all the woodland creatures to believe that the crow is the great owl. The existence of this song alone is a perfect summary of the picture's quality. How bad is the Secret of Nim sequel? Well, let's just say that it has a conga musical number. Take the chance of a lifetime, find out what you should know. A recreation of captivation, a magic mystery show. And then you have the best part of the movie, Just Say Yes. Sure, the song itself is crap, but it's Eric Idle singing as an insane villain. It's the most entertainment that you'll get from this film, so might as well have some fun while you can. You'll be happy, nice and happy, perfect happiness, beyond measure, purest pleasure, if you just say yes! And finally, there's All I Had Is Gone, the sad song where Timmy loses hope on his adventure. Maybe this would have been a bit effective to get an emotion out of the viewer, if it weren't for the fact that it plays soon after Eric Idle's manic number and caused the film to have a tonal whiplash. What can I do? What have I done? I've only managed to hurt everyone. It is possible that these songs can be enjoyable as guilty pleasures, I'll admit that I am fond of Just Say Yes, but if you cannot find any form of pleasure with these musical numbers, then all they do is make the movie worse. I already knew that this movie was bad. Even after hearing different videos talking about this and seeing the film myself before, it was previously registered in my head that this is not good at all. However, after revisiting the picture for the first time in years, I may have underestimated how bad this movie truly is. The Secret of Nim 2 Timmy to the Rescue is one of the worst examples of what happens when a movie gets a sequel without the involvement of the original filmmakers. The consequence is this corporately manufactured picture that is nothing like its predecessor and comes off as this bland and crude animated kids flick with little to no redeeming qualities. The writing is an absolute joke, the story constantly trips on its own feet, the comedy is cringe, the animation is all around weak, the characters are all toxic, and the songs are both unnecessary and poorly crafted. It's safe to say that it's better to watch the first movie, but if there must be a reason for me to recommend watching Timmy to the Rescue, it would honestly just be for riffing purposes. If you're in the mood to watch a bad movie with friends and make jokes about its flaws as they appear, then this could give you a good hour's worth of material. Outside of that, I don't think there is any way to watch this that is unironically enjoyable. Also, if you enjoyed this review, then remember to give this a like and subscribe if you haven't yet. As much as I take down bad sequels like this, I also talk about good movies that are well worth your time. It goes without saying, yeah, this is an obvious animat seal of garbage. 
And considering how I've previously talked about this a few times years ago, I think we can agree that this was long overdue. Hey guys, this is Animat, and boy did that movie suck! But, a funny story though, while I was making this review, there was a sudden memory that just popped into my head where I recalled the last time I watched Timmy to the Rescue, and that was for the list of the top 10 worst animated sequels, and that was a list that I've made years and years ago, but I do recall that the last time I did watch this movie, it was for that list. So. I ended up getting curious to know where specifically did it make it, because I did recall that it did land amongst the top 10, but I was surprised to find that I only put it at number 10 back then. I think it is safe to say that nowadays, if I would go and revise that list, I think, honestly, I would put it slightly higher. I don't think Timmy to the Rescue would make it amongst the top 5 worst animated sequels, but definitely somewhere where it would be above number 10. So it would get a little bit of a boost now that I did fully analyze it and that I did see how bad that this movie really, really was. But either way though, I'm glad that I'm finally done with Timmy to the Rescue. I can finally move on. And speaking of moving on, by the way, it is time that we shall now go and move on to a Patreon request. And this time around, it shall be a request coming from Red Bandit. So, I would just like to go and say that if you would like to be like Red Bandit and you want to go and support my work and get some amazing rewards, including but not limited to seeing my videos before anyone else, then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat. But at the same time, if you would like to suggest an animated film you would like me to review and that I would put onto the animation hat, then all you have to do is write me an email at animatsreviews at gmail.com. So with that said, what is it that Red Bandit requests me for the next review? What is it that he asked me to look into now? Well, the good news is, is that this is definitely going to be much better than Timmy to the Rescue. And this one, funny enough, is actually a familiar story. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is a story that you are familiar with as well. But the way that it is told is a little bit different. This isn't the same story that you have heard time and time again about it. This is actually a different version of this particular story that is actually a lot more well known in the animal kingdom. <laughs> well, that was just between us. <laughs> 